Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Thank you for joining uh, our session entitled Tavi Managing PBL and Permanent Pacemaker Implant Transition Risk Device versus Procedure. And uh, to help us through this session, I'm grateful to be joined by Dr. Anthony Camoglia, an interventional cardiologist from University of Queensland, Brisbane, Australia, and Dr. Kentaro Hayashida, an interventional cardiologist from Kyo University School of Medicine. Tokyo, Japan, both of you, uh, both of whom you should know very well, the experienced uh, TAVI operators. And the objective for the session today is to review uh, the mechanisms and literature of PVL and TAVI, to understand PVL mitigation technologies with modern TAVI devices, to explore deployment techniques to reduce PVL, and to review mechanisms and uh, the literature and PPI in TAVI with current devices. So I'm going to, first of all, the session is going to be split into broad in two halves. The first uh, half will be by Anthony, who will take us through the technologies and the changes in technologies and the impact it has on outcome. And then Kintaro will be taking us through some case-based discussions, um, more into how uh, the technologies are impacting on Asian patients. And he will take us through and guide us through what he's found with the latest technology. So, uh, Anthony, would you kick us off, please? Good evening, um, and thank you for um, the invitation to be involved. It's great to be with all of you again. Um, and uh, this looks to be uh, an interesting evening. Uh, the, the brief I have this evening is to talk around optimization of TAVI in relation to both uh, permanent pacemaker implantation uh, as, well, as well as paravalvular leak. Um, as we enter the third generation of TAVI devices, um, and as we move into lower risk patient populations, there is an incumbent responsibility on us as TAVI operators to strive to deliver surgical-like outcomes for patients re receiving transcatheter aortic valve implantation. Um, we've moved a long way from the early days where we were doing extreme or prohibitive risk patients into a sphere where there is an expectation and a clinical need to deliver valve outcomes that are, are equivalent and in many cases superior to surgical valve implantation. As the technology has evolved, uh, so too uh, have iterative, iterative improvements in the technology. Um, I'm going to discuss with you in particular around the Navitor valve this evening and the engineering enhancements and improvements that have really resulted in the Navitor being a true third generation valve, uh, probably the only true third generation valve um, commercially available in, in most jurisdictions that integrates uh, paravalvular leak mitigation, excellent hemodynamics, predictable, predictable deployment and um, safe procedures. So let's talk about paravalvular leak. I think this is something that most heavy operators would like to think is solved and can be forgotten about. Um, but paravalvular, paravalvular leak uh, remains a problem and paravalvular leak has not been solved by the current second generation devices available. In real world settings, um, balloon expandable systems, contemporary balloon expandable systems, still have significant rates of paravalvular leak, which is mild or more. And uh, up to one in 30 patients in real world settings treated with balloon expandable technology in large, in large data sets have uh, moderate or more paravalvular leak. Now, it's been re reproduced time and again, and I think for all of the experienced TAVI operators online tonight, we know that paravalvular leak leads to poor outcomes. Certainly moderate paravalvular leak and probably mild to moderate, and perhaps there is even a dose relation, dose response relationship between paravalvular leak and poor outcomes all the way down to trivial. Um, again, when our comparator is surgical valves, as it is in low to intermediate risk patients, we cannot afford to have high rates of paravalvular leak. The patients struggle with heart failure and they have higher mortality. 
the Navator device really integrates multiple learnings across uh, different platforms and generations of TAVI technology to mitigate and reduce paravalvular leak. And I'm going to show you some cases tonight around that. The Navator device integrates large cell night alloy uh, material engineering design, a reverse parachute Navi seal paravalvular leak mitigation feature, stable deployment, and true uh, and true TAVI like self expanding large effective orifice area hemodynamics. So let's let's briefly touch on some of the anatomy. The second issue facing TAVI as we compare ourselves with surgery is permanent pacemaker implantation. The conduction structures lie close to where we work. The membranous septum and its length are important considerations in planning TAVI procedures. We know that the bundle after it emerges from the AV node and travels through the membranous septum actually sits basically on this just below the uh, endothelium of the heart in the membranous septum region and is extremely vulnerable to trauma and induction of conduction abnormalities. A body of literature has developed around this and measuring membranous septum length and using it to plan TAVI procedures. And what has been consistently found is that short, the shorter the membranous septum and the more TAVI material that sits in the left ventricular outflow tract and impinges on the membranous septum, the higher the rate of conduction abnormalities and conduction disturbance and potentially poorer long-term outcomes for patients. And we're talking both in relation to the need for permanent pacemaker implantation, as well as sub-threshold conduction abnormalities such as left bundle branch block that can also result in poorer long-term outcomes for patients. Looking at uh, data sets retrospectively, it was no surprise that patients who had shorter membranous septums and larger ratios of device sitting in the outflow tract abutting the membranous septum had higher rates of conduction disturbance, including left bundle branch block, advanced degree conduction block, and the requirement for permanent pacemaker implantation. Now, a lot of TAVI operators were brought up on the adage that permanent pacemakers are essentially benign and do not have negative effects on patient outcomes. It really depends on how one looks at the data. Permanent pacemakers is an area that has not been solved with second generation devices. Real world contemporary data sets in real patients undergoing TAVI who are not screened out in clinical trials tell us that balloon expandable systems have new permanent pacemaker rates between 13 and 15% and new conduction disturbance in more than 30% of patients. And this may well be a consequence of the annular trauma and distortion that is required for satisfactory implantation of balloon expandable centers, uh, balloon expandable valves. These data sets are produced from high volume balloon expandable centers, not from operators using balloon expandable technology for the first time. When we look at longer term outcomes in patients who have permanent pacemaker implantation after a TAVR, there seems to be a fairly consistent signal around higher rates of mortality as we look out to 12 months or more. I think this would ring true for a lot of operators anecdotally over the years that the patients who end up with left bundle branch block or who require a permanent pacemaker and are pacing dependent have poor long-term outcomes. They have higher rates of heart failure and they have higher rates of all cause mortality. So what can we do to try and address this? Well, the first thing is to risk stratify. Patients with pre-existing conduction disturbances, in particular, the trifecta of first degree AV block, 
right bundle branch block and left anterior hemi block are at the highest risk of requiring permanent pacemaker post procedure. Those patients, as we should in all patients, require meticulous planning around procedure and also device selection for a device that is going to cause the least annular trauma to achieve a satisfactory result with minimal paravalvular leak. The Navitor device is really the only third generation device that integrates all of the engineering principles needed to deliver that sort of precision. Is there a role for prophylactic pacemakers? Probably in very selected cases. Again, patients with the trifecta, first degree atrioventricular conduction delay, right bundle branch block with left anterior hemi block. And in particular, if they have any evidence of second degree or advanced degree block on halter monitoring. And if you add into the formula, a hostile annulus with a short membrane septum, perhaps a very limited patient pool could be considered for a prophylactic permanent pacemaker. But in general, prophylactic pacemakers should be avoided and instead meticulous attention to device planning and procedural technique should be employed to try and minimize the requirement for permanent pacemaker implantation. We know this can be achieved with uh, self-expanding technology. Out of the United States, low permanent pacemaker rates with the Evolut platform were demonstrated around one in 10 patients or less by using a high implant technique and minimal manipulation technique and avoidance of annular trauma during procedure. One of the messages around minimizing pacemaker implantation, number one, choose the right technology. Number two, recognize the trauma that balloon expandable systems cause and in real world populations lead to pacemaker rates that are potentially higher than those with more gentle self-expanding systems. And three, selecting a technology that integrates both of those things with paravalvular leak mitigation. So this takes us into procedural process and implementation. What procedural techniques can we use? Well, one of the things we learned from the Evolute data was the employment of a dynamic imaging mindset when deploying a TAVI valve. Simply going to a three cusp view and deploying a balloon expandable valve at a volume that's 10% oversized will in many cases lead to permanent pacemaker implantation. And we see that in real world data sets. Instead, a more finessed version of, of implantation is, is required and has been shown to be effective. And I'm going to propose uh, a hybrid technique that really draws on the experience of the cusp overlay pioneers from the United States, but also from my friend and learned co colleague, Dr. Manaharan, using the stent alignment uh, LAO uh, frame alignment technique. So we've done our procedural CT, we've looked at the annulus in detail, and we've decided that we're going to uh, implant a self-expanding valve. The cusp overlap technique really simply means having a, an image intensifier uh, panel angle that overlays the insertion points of the right and left coronary cusps at the right of screen and the non-coronary cusp at the left of screen. Uh, that's, all, that's all it really means. In most patients, that's an RAO caudal projection of some kind. And if, most implanters, of course, will be familiar with the traditional three cusp view, which is usually an LAO or LAO caudal projection. The problem with the uh, straight LAO or LAO caudal projection is that it foreshortens the left ventricular outflow tract. The area caudal projections, the cusp overlay technique, elongates the left ventricular outflow tract and gives us a much clearer picture of where the bottom of our frame is sitting in relation to the outflow tract to facilitate safe, higher device implantation, but at the same time avoiding device pop out, which is uh, potentially a consequence if one implants a valve too high. So, in a standard TAVI procedure, we do our balloon valvioplasty. We then advance the Navitor system 
using the cusp overlay angle, which is uh, in most patients aria cordal, and and we derive of CT. And owing to the hemodynamic stability that is evident during deployment of the Navator system, in a controlled way, we can open the valve and with micro adjustments position it such that the base of the frame sits three millimeters below the non-coronary cusp insertion point. When we deploy Navator systems, this is able to be done in a controlled, measured fashion with no rush. The reason for this is that being an intra-annular valve design, leaflet function comes online almost as soon as we begin to open the valve. So there is no need for rapid pacing or rush deployments. In the left of screen, we can see the cusp overlay uh, image, which demonstrates really a perfect implant height. We then incorporate some of the old ways and the technique that uh, uh, Dr. Manaharan has really pioneered, the frame alignment technique, where we basically go from the RAO cordal cusp overlay view and we track straight over to a steep LAO until the base of the frame is perfectly aligned and check our position in that view as well. Once the valve is positioned, the integrated engineering comes into play. The Naviseal skirt is a reverse parachute billowing system that fills any gaps that are not already looked after by the large cell design, which allows engagement and integration of calcium nodules between valve frame struts. Over time, there's fibrous ingrowth of the Naviseal skirt, so that at 30 days and 12 months, there are low rates of paravalvular leak. Even at the end of the procedure, and in most cases, and in most patients without the need for post dilatation, like in this case where no post dilatation was required, there is either either no or trivial paravalvular leak, and this is even better the next day and at 30 days, where we see trivial or no leak in in uh, in virtually all patients. This was reflected in the 30-day outcomes, of course, of the Portico NG data set. The valve is versatile and able to be used in small anatomies. And we know how important lifetime planning for coronary access has become an important consideration in TAVI procedures. Other self-expanding systems have a superannular design and will not facilitate adequate coronary access in the future. Navator offers the best of an intraannular system, but without the trauma of a balloon expandable system and also offers superior hemodynamics. I think most TAVI operators have recognised for a long time that self-expanding systems offer larger effective orifice areas. Even in small annuli, it is part of the course and expected that when we implant an avatar or portico system, we end up with an effective orifice area of around two or more. We know that with balloon expandable systems, this isn't the case, and this has been demonstrated in several data sets. Interestingly, we also know that despite the fact that Navator has an intra-annular leaflet design which maximizes coronary access in the future, hemodynamics between the Navator system and the supra-annular Evolute system are superimposable. There is no difference. So there is nothing lost by the benefit of having the intra-annular leaflet design rather than the supra-annular leaflets in terms of hemodynamics. And so with the Navator system, the benefits of higher effective orifice areas are maintained, but without the cost to coronary reaccess that we see with supraannular self-expanding systems. I'll show you a, a further case example in a patient with small anatomy. And again, simple procedure, pre-dilatation, cusp overlay implantation, check in the frame alignment view, no paravalvular leak. And uh, we'll just look at that more closely so you can see there's none. <laughs> and, uh, no pre and no post dilatation required. And 
hemodynamics that are just remarkable. So really just to summarize, paravalvular leak is a problem. Second generation systems, and they include the currently commercially available balloon expandable systems, as well as the currently super annular self-expanding systems do not address that problem in a satisfactory way. Navitor represents a third generation system that addresses that. Secondly, pacemaker implantation and conduction disturbance is a real problem. And we need to adapt our techniques, integrating self-expanding systems with paravalvular leak mitigation, minimizing annular tr trauma to maximize patient outcomes and minimize conduction disturbance. And just finally, so as to demonstrate that this is backed by data. We recently put together a retrospective study of nearly 300 patients in the Australian setting treated with the old version of Navitor. So not even the, not even the um, Mercedes-Benz model, third generation Navitor system, this is Portico. And with the Portico system, in real-world intermediate to high-risk patients, average age 82, STS score of 5, we saw a pacemaker rate of 10% or less, and the pacemaker rate in patients with the FlexNav de delivery system, which came online a little bit later, was actually below 10%, low rates of mortality, high effective orifice areas over 2. And this was with the first really with the first to second generation portico flex nav system what we're able to achieve now with navitor is just another step uh, uh, ahead and uh, is really quite exciting and gives us a chance to deliver patients surgical type outcomes so i'll finish up there and, and hand over to my colleagues and uh, again thank you for the opportunity to share and learn with you tonight Wow, wow, wow. Anthony, thank you so much. You've summarized the one day symposium into 15, 20 minutes. Awesome job. Thank you for that. Um, I've been taking some notes uh, during your presentation, and uh, I'll bring Kentaro into this as well. Uh, you mentioned early on that the membrane septum length uh, predicts the impact on a pacemaker, first of all. So in real world, in your practice, how often would you measure membrane septum length or do you not measure it at all? First to Anthony, and then I'll ask Kentaro the same question. No, I, I don't measure it at all. And I guess the uh, analogy I would give, it's kind of a little bit like what OCT was to coronary anatomy or IVUS. I think early on, we all used OCT and IVUS a lot, and I still use it, not infrequently, but it taught us a lesson about coronary anatomy, which was OCT and IVUS taught us that we need to make our stents bigger than we think we should just based on angiographic appearance. So getting to the point, the analogy is that we don't measure this, the membrane septum length routinely, but having an appreciation of it uh, reminds us how critically important achieving a high but safe implant is to minimise pacemaker implant, uh, implantation rates as well as uh, induction of conduction disturbance. Kentaro, same to you. Do you routinely measure number of central length? Thank you very much, Ganesh. Thank you very much, Ganesh. Actually, uh, we don't measure uh, member and septum that much. And uh, in our in initial experience, we tried to do that. But there are some uh, various uh, measurement method, and each method provides a different uh, measurement. That reason why so uh, we are not that much a uh, big fan of the uh, measurement of the membrane septum, but of course the uh, if the patient had really high risk for the uh, uh, pacemaker implantation, uh, sometimes we uh, try to measure the membrane septum. So we don't believe that much, honestly. And what uh, what is your optimal deployment depth uh, when you're using, say, an avatar, for example? What what would you aim for? Uh, to Kentaro first, and then I'll come back to Anthony. Yeah, so uh, uh, we try to deploy at the three millimeter depth. And uh, if the patient doesn't have that much calcification on the leaflet, uh, 
to avoid the uh, upward motion and migration, uh, we tend to de deploy four or five millimeter as far as the, there is uh, not the high risk for the pacemaker implantation. And Anthony? Uh, three millimeters, uh, but on the three to four side uh, of three millimeters with two important caveats. Number one, the Navator system is not Evolute. So the strengths of the Navator system is that it's flexible, cell frame is larger, coronary axis is better, paravalvular leak mitigation is better. Because it's more flexible and because the nitinol takes time to warm up, you need to take your time to avoid pop out. So to get all those benefits, which make it, in my view, a superior system to any of the other self-expanding platforms available, you need to really not think like an Evolute operator, which has its own set of rules for implantation, you know, strictly speaking, using uh, the uh, cusp overlay technique from the US for Evolute implantation. That means using a very heavy Lundquist wire and all that stuff. With the Navator system, you need to take your time, you put the valve in, cusp overlay, go to the LAO, have a look, and wind that wheel one to two turns every 10 or 15 seconds. The way the valve works means you can do that safely because you have stable hemodynamics throughout. You do not get obstruction. You ensure that you do not have tension on the system in general, my last sort of movement or tension would be slightly forward on the system, but having no tension as I'm getting close to release, making sure there's no tension on the wire, integrating all of those things and, again, taking the time to make sure it's expanding gives you the fruits of doing that, which is uh, a deployment with excellent effective orifice areas equivalent to superannular systems but with paravalvular leak mitigation, that's equivalent to a balloon expandable system and better in cases of calcification where balloon expandable systems are risky. I mean, you touched on two important points then. Number one, the Navator flex and delivery system is not the Natronic system, and that's a really good point. And secondly, taking your time. Self-expanding technologies do need 15, 30 seconds to show an effect. And I think that's really important. And especially if you've resheathed once, to wait for 15 seconds for it to fully expand is equally important before assessing the outcomes. The other area I tend to pay attention to also is the nose cone as well. And I think the nose cone constantly rubbing the left bundle is a precursor for a uh, conduction of mouse. And what I tend to do is once I cross the valve, I tend to pull the pre shaped wire back a little bit. That tends to lift the nose cone away, but and that a bit like lifting a skirt up a little bit of the uh, nose cone, and that then tends to move away from the left bundle. And I think that also tends to minimize the risk of conduction manuality, both acutely and chronically as well. Now, uh, what I think I'll do in the interest of time, I will go to Kentaro's talk, and then we will approach the PBL uh, story after Kentaro's presentation. So Kentaro, take it away, please, to uh, give us your presentation of the impact on New, new generation technologies in predominantly Asian patients and the, the differences between Asian patients and what, what we tend to see on clinical trial data. Anthony, one second, thank you. Thank you very much, Ganesh. Okay, and so thank you very much for a kind invitation. And today we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about how does the Japanese clinical evidence compare with study in the West. And this is my disclosure, and now I'm the proctor for the Abbott as well. And first of all, the Tabit uh, device is introduced uh, 20 years ago. Uh, this year is the 20th anniversary, thanks to Dr. Uh, Professor Alan Crevier. And uh, I had a chance to work uh, in France uh, when I was a fellow in Massy, France, uh, from 2009 to 2012. And... Uh, and uh, I had a good experience in Massey with Dr. Tilly Lefebvre uh, for the introduction of a TAVI procedure. But however, at that time, the mortality is still quite high, like 10% 30-day uh, mortality. 
And uh, I think the uh, I need to have my public missions. The first one is safe introduction of Taibi to Japan and Asian countries. And uh, I also think that Japan uh, should be uh, an equal partner to Western countries. And therefore, uh, we started some study uh, with our friends, uh, Dr. Masanori Yamamoto, in, now in Toyohashi Heart Center, and uh, Dr. Yusuke Watanabe, uh, now in Tokyo University Hospital. And we conducted two center registry using the French data, and we published some data mimicking the uh, small body size patient. Uh, however, uh, we think that uh, we should publish some paper from Japan. And therefore, we started the uh, Ocean SHD uh, family. And uh, we constructed the uh, Ocean Tabby Registry. And uh, fortunately, uh, seven, uh, 97 papers has already been accepted. And now the uh, more than 50 projects are still ongoing. And these are the centers included in Ocean SED family. I'm quite sure that you cannot read it because it's in Chinese letter. And that these are, they are the members of our uh, scheme. And uh, what are the anatomical features of Asian patient? Uh, they have a small, smaller body size and eventually leads to the smaller angles. And maybe uh, they may have a uh, risk of the prosthesis patient mismatch. And if you look at the literature and uh, the, the study comparing the surgical ABR and the type of procedure demonstrated the uh, lower incidence of prosthesis patient mismatch in the patient with small annulus that is published in 2014. And if you look at the uh, data from TBT registry, the CPA prosthesis patient mismatch is noted in the 12% in American patient. I think that's quite high, even with the TABI procedure. And uh, we conducted the study to evaluate the incidence of a severe and moderate prosthesis patient mismatch. And the moderate PPM was noted in 8.9%. However, a severe prosthesis patient mismatch is noted only in 0.7%. That is much lower than that of the United States, and presumably due to lower body surface area in our cohort, because we Japanese patients are not that obese uh, compared to the uh, Amer American patients. And uh, Dr. Park from Korea uh, also published the data comparing the Asian and non-Asian patient. And Asian patients have the lower incidence of prosthesis patient mismatch compared to non-Asian patients. That also demonstrates that the uh, Asian patients have the uh, uh, lower incidence of prosthesis patient mismatch compared to non-Asian patients. And this is the initial result of our Ocean Tabby Registry. And if you look at the uh, data from Sapiens 3, and 20 millimeter uh, very small valve is used in the 8.5% in native valve. And the <coughs> 23 millimeter Evolute R device is uh, used in 10%. Uh, that means the uh, these quite small valve is used in the native aortic annulus in our cohort. <clears throat> and this slide shows the hemodynamic uh, performance. If you look at the slide with the 20 millimeter sapien 3, even with this quite small valve, the mean pressure gradient is like 14 or something, and that, that may lead to the uh, less incidence of prosthesis patient mismatch, thanks to the uh, smaller body surface area. And we also conducted the study comparing the uh, Evolute R and Sepin 3 in the patient with small annulus. And uh, there was no significant difference in device success and all cause death and new permanent pacemaker. And there was a trend towards a lower incidence of moderate uh, PPM in Evolute R. However, there was no significant difference in severe PPM between two groups. And Evolute R demonstrated better hemodynamic, hemodynamic performance over Sepin 3. 
However, uh, it didn't have the, uh, any negative impact on all cause of mortality during the follow-up. And now, so we have the third device, Nibiter, uh, from this May. And uh, we used some cases. I'd like to demonstrate some case example. And this is the case, one 88 years old female. Uh, she developed very severe aortic stenosis in the body surface area is 1.3. And if you look at the CT scan, that she had quite a small aortic annulus of 290. And the size of the sinus of the is okay, like 26 or 27. And iliofemoral femoral axis is quite good. <clears throat> and therefore, we decided to deploy the 23 millimeter navigator device. And this is the uh, final uh, deployment. Uh, we could deploy the valve like two millimeter depths or three millimeter depths without any regurgitation. And this is the uh, post-procedural CT scan. And the navigator device was expanded quite well. And it was fixed uh, to the SMD aorta. And mean pressure gradient was decreased to 50 millimeter mercury, and I think that's quite a good hemodynamic performance, even in the very small aortic annulus. And this is a case too, very severe aortic stenosis, and the body surface area is also small, like 1.2. <clears throat> And this CT scan demonstrate the uh, small amount of LVO decalcification at the zero o'clock. And it usually is not associated with the uh, rupture. However, uh, because of the heavy calcification, uh, we decided to deploy the uh, navigator system. And we chose 25 millimeter navigator system. And uh, we performed the pre uh, very quite well. And finally, uh, this is the uh, implantation of navigator system, like three millimeter depth. And uh, moderate AR was decreased to mild PBL. And this is a post-procedural CT scan. Even though the inflow of navigator device is the elliptical, however, the, it expands very well and hemodynamic performance is quite good and uh, we have very minimal PV uh, after procedure, even with the uh, LVO decalcification. And this is a third case, and uh, with the LVO decalcification, and uh, she also had the body surface area, area of 1.35. And as you could see, uh, she had a really uh, extensive LVO decalcification. And we saw that the, uh, she had a high risk for the annulus rupture with balloon expandable valve. And idiofemoral access should be okay. And therefore, we also chose a navigator system, 25 millimeter. And uh, we tried to deploy the navigator system at a three millimeter depth. However, after uh, deployment, it moved uh, upward, like the minus uh, position. And however, the thanks to the LVO decalcification, uh, the BAV still remains in the aortic BAV complex. And finally, the PBL was mild and the hemodynamic performance is great. And we uh, finished the procedure. However, we need to avoid this kind of pop-up motion and we really need to know how to avoid this kind of the uh, unpredicted upward motion. This is the post-procedure CT scan. As you can see, the inflow of the navigator device is higher than the level of annulus, but luckily, the, thanks to LVO decalcification, navigator wasn't migrated into ascending aorta. And we experienced the 15 cases in mean age 86 uh, years old, and the 23 millimeter valve is predominantly used in our cohort and predilatation was performed in all cases, and the no case required post dilatation, and uh, all the cases are treated uh, with the uh, integrated sheath, and we didn't need a snare technique in any case.
And hemodynamic performance was achieved greatly, even with the uh, very small INOS. We were a little bit skeptical that the interannual expanded device uh, have the uh, very good hemodynamics. But after procedure, uh, the, the results convinced as the navigator system has quite good hemodynamic performance. And uh, this is the uh, post-procedure AR. Uh, no case developed the uh, moderate or severe AR. And slightly the mortality was zero and moderate severe PPR zero and the no coronary occlusion. However, one third of the case uh, required pacemaker implantation. Uh, therefore, we need to improve the uh, deployment technique to mitigate the risk of the pacemaker implantation. And this is our initial impression of Navier system. Very soft shot and very good deliverability. I think this is the best uh, device for the interfemoral axis. And uh, it also provides good hemodynamic in a small annulus. And hemodynamic stability during implantation is quite good. It's uh, the interannual device. And uh, this uh, device also provides better coronary access. That is quite important for the patient uh, in younger patient. And however, we need to avoid a pop-up. And uh, what do <clears throat> what we don't have in Japan so far, and uh, we don't have new devices. We still have some uh, device lack uh, between Western country and Asian countries. We don't have cerebral protection device. We really need it. And uh, we don't have the indication of the tab in tab procedure and bioprosthetic valve fracture and transcaver operation. And we need to decrease device lag, and it still remains as important issue. And uh, tab in tab procedure is quite prevalent in our country. And uh, a lot of patients received 19 or 21 millimeter surgical valve. And however, uh, we deployed the TAV uh, device in uh, failed surgical uh, aortic valve. And finally, it worked well because of the uh, lower body surface area. And it doesn't lead to the uh, processing patient mismatch. And the TAV in TAV is not approved in Japan yet. Hopefully, uh, in the next year, uh, this procedure will be approved in our country. And uh, lastly, uh, now we uh, studied the PCR Tokyo bath from 2016. And if uh, you're interested, you are most welcome to come over to Japan. And uh, in 2020, uh, we had uh, more than uh, 1,000 attendees. And this year, uh, we're going to have the uh, series of webinars. And the next year, uh, we're going to have the on-site meeting in February. If you're interested in, uh, you're quite welcome. So please uh, come to uh, Tokyo. And in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have learned a lot from Western countries and the lower incidence of processes patient mismatch uh, is noted in Japan and Asia. And there is still remains uh, life expectancy, remaining life expectancy is now similar and data on small anatomy is quite important and simultaneous approval of new devices and indication were quite important for us. Thank you very much for your attention. Kenta, thank you so much for the overview of how Tavi has expanding, is expanding in Japan, but more importantly, how the, or the differences and challenges compared to what we see in the Western world uh, in terms of patient characteristics. Uh, and I think, Japanese patients are a little bit like Northern Ireland patients. Tend the females tend to be uh, female patients tend to be smaller, and therefore we we do need um, more data, I guess, uh, to look at how these new technologies compare and work in small anatomy patients, and also the impact it has on coronary access. Now I know in Japan, Navato and Plexnav really has been available since May. Um, and in that very short time, you have demonstrated how uh, in small anatomy, the access is excellent. But also you've shown two, at least of the three cases, the four cases you showed, two of them had quite significant LVOT calcification. And I think you've shown very nicely and eloquently how the um, active seal and the navigator seal that's present in the navigator deals with this anatomy very well and confidently as well. Um, now, we, we have about 14, 15 minutes for discussions. 
I do know on the web chat that there are participants who are having difficulty either hearing us logging on. And I just want to reassure you that PCR team are trying to fix it. Uh, however, if they are unable to fix it, this uh, session is being recorded and you will be able to view it in full, uh, in color uh, at the PCR website. So uh, apologies uh, on behalf of all of us that if you can't hear or, or see what we're doing. And um, so we spent some time talking about PPI before, uh, maybe I should spend some time now talking about PBL. Um, so Kentaro, first of all, you've now access to three technologies of all the latest generation of each companies. Where do you think Nevertor fits in your armamentarium of access and uh, choice of valve for your patients? Thank you very much, Ganesh. Actually, the, uh, before a certain procedure, uh, as I talked, uh, we are a little bit skeptical that the uh, interannular expanding device provides good hemodynamics. But the, the results convinced that the uh, navigator system provides us very nice hemodynamics. And that means they are in, especially in the patient with small onions as well as the large body surface area, uh, we can use the Navier as well as the Evolute uh, device. And the Navier device also provides very nice deliverability because the sheath is quite uh, good and the shaft is so soft and it's quite easy to deliver uh, the device uh, to the annulus. And it also uh, provides the uh, better coronary access that is also very good for the patient uh, with the coronary artery disease as well as the younger patient. And last but not least, in the NABICU, it provides a very nice ceiling. And we can use this kind of the uh, device for the uh, case with LBOT calcification. And finally, uh, we experienced several cases with LBOT calcification all the case ended up with the uh, uh, mild PBL. Anthony, uh, similar question to you. You showed your experience with Portico. Uh, in our experience, the Navator is not the Portico. They've taken, Abbott has taken all the good bits of Portico and re-engineered a completely different valve. Uh, is that what you find in your experience with Navator so far? Yeah, thanks, Ganesh. Um, First, I'm going to quickly digress and just say, Kantara, that was fantastic. Um, I learned a lot from you. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I guess Australia's kind of, we're not really Western or Eastern. We're just this funny thing down near Antarctica. Um, but there's plenty we can learn from Japan. Uh, <laughs> that was um, really great, Kantaro. Um, look, yeah, the Navator, it, it, it's a big, it, it really is a big iterative improvement. It's, it's, um, it's more deliverable. It's more predictable. Um, the Portico was an okay valve, um, but it was a first-generation device, and it punched way above its weight. Um, uh, Abbott have really taken uh, all of the learnings from that technology and incorporated the best of both worlds from the other major vendors. The uh, Kentaro touched on the effective orifice area patient prosthesis mismatch story, and I, you know, I suspect the we all grew up on one system or another, and I, yeah, I suspect Kentaro sort of perhaps in the past got used to having an effective orifice area below two or one and a half with the Edward system, which is probably not going to be acceptable long term for patients, especially when they're going to need valve and valve procedures down the track. The intraannular leaflet design, which Portico had and Navator has taken on, um, somewhat surprisingly, but uh, perhaps not has hemodynamics that are really uh, superimposable or identical to Evolute. Um, we saw in the Portico IDE study uh, where Portico was compared to both Sapien uh, as, as well as core valve Evolute. Uh, in terms of effective orifice area, Navator and, uh, sorry, Portico and Evolute were superimposable. They both had effective orifice areas across all sizes, around two or more. Um, especially in the smaller annuli patients, not surprisingly, uh, the balloon expandable system had uh, significantly smaller effective orifice areas. And whether or not it reaches a threshold of a defined number for what patient prosthesis mismatch is, why wouldn't you give the patient a system that predictably delivers a superior effective orifice area but still maintains an intraannular leaflet design and better coronary access? 
good points, really good points. Back to um, Kentaro, just on um, procedural procedural tips and tricks. So you're deploying the valve, and before, just to remind people again, the Navato is a resheatable technology, so you are able to resheat and reposition. Uh, in what circumstances would you use the resheatable feature, uh, or when would you use it? Thank you very much, Ganesh. So actually, the uh, we try to deploy the Navitor valve at the three millimeter, and sometimes the, it tends to go up like one millimeter or something. Then, so we need to resheat this to avoid the migration of the valve. And and of course, the, if the Navitor device go a little bit deeper, like five or six millimeter, it tends to lead to the uh, pacemaker implantation. So we definitely uh, resheat the device. Uh, lead to the uh, much higher position to avoid the pacemaker implantation. And I feel that the Navitor device is quite easy to control. You don't need to push the uh, safari wire that much. And uh, it uh, expands very smoothly and uh, it doesn't go down that much. And it's quite uh, easy to manipulate. This is my uh, initial experience. Same question to Anthony as well. Uh, I think, and you've probably experienced this yourself, Ganesh, like any system, you, you get better at it the more you do. There's no question about that. I think, I think, um, uh, Kentaro, as you get m more and more with the Navitor, you'll find that you resheath less and less. Um, really, the mindset of it's not evolute, it's not sapien, um, positioning it at three to three, I, I basically say three to three and a half millimeter, like the four millimeter side of three millimeters, but really take my time to keep it there with micro adjustments, cusp overlay for most of it, and then transitioning to the frame alignment, steep LA overview. And I think not resheathing while it's there is something that can be done if you really need to optimize things further, but not needing to fully resheath. Um, probably reduces the risk of pacemaker, less manipulation, less trauma to the bundle. Um, so yes, resheathing is easy to do with the device. It's it's uh, very simple, uh, but taking the slow deployment means you can avoid it a lot of the time. The other uh, time I tend to, I, I don't like post dilatation. I think post dilatation of any valve carries risks. Uh, including an uh, rupture, stroke, embolic phenomena, even valve migration. And what I tend to do sometimes, uh, if on releasing the valve to two thirds, I'm talking about uh, Navitor or even uh, Evolute, uh, reassessing PVL at that time. And if there is, say, more than mild, I tend to wait for another 15 seconds. If it still remained more than mild, I tend to resheat partially and re release again. And when we do that, what we've noticed is the Navitor valve certainly aligns better to the anatomy. Uh, and tends to fill the gaps where it needs to be. And by doing that, we've reduced our post dilatation rate uh, with the Navitor from uh, 15 to 18% during the portico days and Evolute our days now to under 5% post dilatation rate, which is, I think, a, a, a big win for patients. Uh, it certainly has reduced uh, our complication rates with post dilatation. And, uh, you know, the last time I've used a valve in valve, a second valve to fix a migrated valve or valve that's too leaky it was nearly enough four and a half years ago now. So I think it's important for participants to realize that, you know, if you are releasing these valves at two thirds, do not release to complete release. If you notice anything that is not right, if it looks a bit deep, don't be afraid to resheat because the risk of resheating is exceedingly low, but the benefits significantly outweighs it. Um, and also be prepared to wait 15, 20 seconds to see what the device does. Uh, and by resheating and releasing again partially, partial resheating does improve outcomes sometimes quite significantly. Um, we've talked about the PVL, we've talked about uh, pacemaker implantation. Um, I guess the key other areas are in terms of how, you know, although they're two separate entities, they do tend to work together. You know, you do need a certain depth to maintain PVL or to minimize PVL, but also too much depth tr triggers pacemaker implantations. 
How do you find that? How do you work through those balance in, in your head when you see a patient? I'll start with Anthony and then I go to Kentaro. Oh, look, I think um, uh, with the Navator in particular, uh, you have a, a real sweet spot between two and five millimeters. And like I said, I sort of aim for three to four, where you get minimal pacemaker. And um, even with the old portico, you can really have pacemaker rates. 10% or less, like I showed you. And with Navator, um, I suspect it'll be lower, especially in the lower risk patients. Um, so I think you get the best of both worlds, really, if you aim for that optimal implant height. Um, I also just, uh, incidentally, uh, you've you've identified something that I guess on hindsight that I've kind of noticed that I'm going to integrate into my practice a bit more in relation to um, if it's basically a bit constrained during the first deployment, um, uh, and you're waiting and you're waiting, there's nothing to be lost by partially resheathing, dropping it a millimetre and then opening again. I, I, I get what you're saying and I, that rings true. The same question again, Taro, please. Thank you very much, Ganesh. Actually, it's the totally balancing act. And uh, if the patient had the previous pacemaker, we don't need to care about the new pacemaker implantation and we can deploy wherever we want. And however, uh, we deploy too deep, of course, email leads to the pacemaker implantation and uh, to make the adaptive C work, uh, I think the three to five millimeter depth is quite important. And now, so we are still in our initial experience, the avoiding pop up is quite important. But today we learn a lot from both of you that the uh, rotating device and opening the device very quite slowly is the, uh, quite important. And uh, I think that the, uh, <clears throat> I think the, uh, uh, for a navigator, we need to open a little bit slower than the ablet because the once we rotate the knob a little bit, it open up much more than the ablet. So that is the difference between devices. And today we learned a lot. Thank you so much. So, yeah. Uh you both will be surprised, but we are nearly running out of time. So I am now going to conclude for next minute. Um, first of all, thank you to Anthony and Kantaro for taking their time and presenting and to all of you for joining us. Just to summarize the session, I think um, when you're talking about permanent pacemaker implantation and PBL, there are some things you just can't change. That's the patient. They come with significant calcification or very narrow LBOTs and calcified LBOTs or pre-existing conduction disturbances that you can't change, which will increase the risk of permanent pacemaker uh, implantation rate and will, will potentially increase the need for PBL. However, there are things you can change. I think the Navator with the flexion delivery system is truly a next generation device and it has a superior deliverability. And as you've seen from our presenters, it does provide a, a best in class PBL data we all, I think, still will need to work on pacemaker implantation rate. In my unit, I'm achieving about 2 to 3% implantation rate in patients who are conduction disturbance naive. Um, and I think you can achieve it by selecting the right kind of technologies, but also uh, making sure that you pay attention on the per uh, implantation techniques. And finally, um, it is important uh, when we look at uh, patients to look at the patient in an individualized manner. So you pick the valve that suits the patient uh, not all technologies will suit every patient. So I think today with all the technology we have, 80% will suit all technologies, but in certain patients, you need to pick the right valve for the right patient. So with that, I would like to thank all of you for joining us. I would like to once again, thank our presenters, both Anthony and Kantura for taking their time this morning to join us. Uh, and I wish you all a happy day and uh, keep learning. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.